Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, welcome to this uh, fourth event of uh, our cycle of uh, conferences and debates on uh, new technologies and, and warfare. Uh, thanks especially to, to all of you in Geneva who came despite the rain. And uh, I want to explain to our audience on the web, that's why we are late, because we had a heavy rain in Geneva, so we start a little late this, this conference. So thanks for your patience. It's indeed a live webcast. Uh, so we have also uh, people following this uh, event uh, on, on the internet. So uh, thanks to, to all of you. Um, our cycle of uh, event, as I said, focuses on the development and use of new technologies in warfare. Uh, we have seen in, in recent years the development of new means and methods of warfare, new technologies entering the battlefield, such as drones, robots, cyber warfare. And we think there is no doubt uh, international humanitarian law applies uh, to them, applies to their use. Uh, however, applying those rules, like pre-existing rules to uh, uh, new technologies, uh, make us ask the questions, are they clear enough? Are they adapted enough? So these are the challenges we want to discuss in this series of events. I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Vincent Bernard. I'm the editor-in-chief of the International Review of the Red Cross. And uh, I am hosting this, this event uh, here at the ICRC headquarters in, in Geneva. So we have had several events on specific issues. Some of you may have attended our first uh, conference on the 25th of March here in Geneva, which discussed various legal, operational, and ethical questions linked to the development and use of new technologies in warfare. We had a second event, a panel on autonomous weapons and armed conflict, during the conference of the American Society of International Law in Washington, D.C. in April. And recently, we also had a webinar, a web seminar, on new warfare and technologies and new protection challenges in partnership with the HPCR in Boston. So this event is, as I said, part of a cycle. Uh, you will find more information on our leaflet here, uh, which uh, present also the, the upcoming events. So we'll have a panel on soldier enhancement, new technologies, and the future battlefield in Melbourne next week in Australia. Then uh, the cycle will end with two events here in Geneva, a webinar on technological innovation and humanitarian action. And finally, uh, the cycle will end with an event at the Maison de la Paix in partnership with the Geneva Academy of IHL and uh, Human Rights. So the recording of all these events will be uh, available on the web, uh, and you can just access our web page using the QR code on, on the leaflet. So cyber warfare is obviously a very important uh, new development in the field of, of warfare and, and possible humanitarian consequences. So we devote two, two events, actually. Uh, the past two days, there was a workshop devoted to, to this issue. And this event tonight uh, marks also the, the end of this workshop. So probably uh, most of the participants uh, who were there in this workshop uh, will make good use of the discussions. And uh, that will be probably reflected in our debates tonight. Um, I would like to thank all the panelists for joining us. Our moderator, initial moderator, Eneken Tik Ringas, uh, could uh, not attend uh, this event. Uh, but we are very happy to have Dr. Heather Roth with us tonight, who kindly accepted to replace Eneken. Thank you very much. So Heather is currently a lecturer at the Corbell School at the University of Denver. And our research interests include international ethics and the just war tradition, and how it relates to emerging new technologies of warfare. Our current research projects include cyber use of force short of war, and moral and legal aspects related to lethal autonomous weapons. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. And Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you very much.
Thank you, and thank you all for coming tonight and braving the rain. Um, I know that I had to run quite quickly through it to get here, and uh, I'm not too must, so that's good. Um, so I'd like to introduce our panelists for this evening uh, really quickly, and their bios are actually available in your pamphlet, and they should be available online as well. Um, I should also note that <clears throat> two procedural things. Everybody here, I think except for Laurent, is uh, going to be speaking in their private capacities. They are not going to be representing any particular state or institution's viewpoints. Uh, the, other in, the other instance is a clarific clarificatory issue, which is trying to keep separate um, issues of use ad bellum and issues of use in bello. And so when we're talking about the law of hostilities, that's a particular area, and the justification to fight is another, um, a justification to use force is another area. So um, I think the panelists will try to keep those um, separate. And uh, I, it's a good heuristic as well for you to try to keep those separate in your, in your minds as you go forward and ask questions. So uh, quickly, we have uh, Duco Leclerc. I don't speak French. Um, and uh, he is the legal and policy advisor for the Netherlands Ministry of Defense. And so we'd like to welcome him and his, his opinions um, on the cyber uh, warfare and other legal aspects of warfare that he is working on. Uh, we have uh, the chief scientist, Dr. Herbert Lin, um, for the Computer Science and Telecommunications Board and the National Research Council. Um, he has been working on these issues quite prolifically for uh, um, some time. We have uh, Laurent Giselle, Giselle uh, the legal advisor for the ICRC, and um, again, uh, particularly interested right now in emerging technologies and cyber. We have uh, Dr. Zhu Longi, uh, the associate research fellow at the China Institute of International Studies. And we have Dr. Um, professor Bradley J. Strasser, an associate professor at uh, the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. And with that, um, I'd like to begin some questions. So the first question I'd actually like to pose is a definitional one, so we're all working from the same page. And that is, um, briefly, if each, of the, if each of the panelists could give me their view and their definitions of cyber. Start with you, Brad. <laughs> just cyber? Just the word cyber? Oh, I wasn't prepared for that. Um, ones and zeros, uh, computer stuff, the binary world of uh, uh, stuff that we can't touch. Uh, well, maybe we can, but we can't feel it. Uh, that we all uh, run the magical devices that we carry around with us every day on. Uh, but it also is far beyond, of course, our personal computers and our network computers and our uh, business computers. It's also the, the uh, information uh, superstructure girding most of our infrastructure today uh, in the corporate and uh, industrial realms, uh, guiding our transportation, our communication, our economies, our markets, and uh, becoming an indispensable part of everyday life. How about that? That's cyber. And cyber conflict is when bad things happen in that space, and you don't want those bad things to happen. I've already moved to that from other bad things which also happen in cyberspace, which is, for example, cyber crime or cyber terrorism or uh, cyber espionage. And at least when we at the ICRC speak of cyber warfare, that has nothing to do with industrial espionage and that is different from cyber crime and cyber terrorism. But it's really when you use a cyber operation as a means and method of warfare in an armed conflict in the sense of international humanitarian law. So basically when you use one and zero, as uh, BJ said, when you use one and zero to kill people or to destroy or degrade objects in an armed conflict. Uh, very briefly uh, about the uh, concept of cyber. Cyber, uh, personally, I think, uh, contains two parts. One is the hard part, the cyber, uh, the uh, internet infrastructure, uh, infrastructure uh, structure. As the soft part is about the information, personal uh, information, and so on, and uh, maybe uh, intellectual property rights, and so on. That's all. Um, yeah, I'm afraid my esteemed co-panelist stole the ones and zeros, which was I was, 
which was I was going to name as well. Um, however, my other esteemed co-panelist has the very valid point that the physical infrastructure that um, all these ones and zeros live in um, is, is in fact also a part of, of cyberspace. And I, I think um, cyber warfare, um, as, as, a, as a phrase, um, is um, somewhat confusing. Um, Cyber warfare has been used for a very broad range of, of cyber activities which um, do not necessarily qualify as, as warfare or armed conflict, if you will. Um, so to, to keep it pure, I would suggest that cyber warfare is, is somewhat broader and vaguer than cyber armed conflict. And I think that last one is what we're talking about today. And I think my microphone's off a bit. Um, Okay, great. So I, I think there's a few questions still at, at play here, right? So if we have an idea that there's hardware and software and data and infrastructure um, and information nodes and everything else and cables, things, right? Um, it's still a little bit ambiguous about what we think cyber warfare is um, in terms of we have a very stark definition that it is these types of means used in the conduct of hostilities that Laurent has, has discussed. And then we have the kind of, it's really vague. So um, I'm wondering if uh, we have, between these two posts, I will, I will ask uh, maybe to BJ to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on you. Um, you know, start, start over here. And then I'm gonna follow, I'd ask um, Herb to, to follow it up on the technical side a little bit. So on the moral side, what do you see as cyber warfare in the just war tradition? And then Herb, what do you see as cyber warfare in the technical tradition? Yeah, well, from a moral perspective, from a moral perspective, I think cyber warfare is uh, just yet one more advancement in the means that people can use when they want to engage one another to exert their will. Uh, it's, it's one more method, it's one more weapon uh, of war that's been developed by human beings throughout the history of time. We keep coming up with better and more, well, maybe not better, but more interesting and more uh, sophisticated ways to harm and kill, and, but also just influence or uh, force a, a political will or some other agenda upon other human beings. And so in that regard, morally, I, I don't think cyber warfare is, um, in, in terms of what it is as, as a tool of warfare, uh, is not particularly morally unique. Uh, it's different, and it has all kinds of new difficult ramifications in the way we understand that. But in that sense, I think it's just yet one more extension in the long history of, of ways human beings have uh, figured out to use uh, the tools available to them to wage war. So the, the definition of warfare has a long and storied history, which the, to, to a large extent the United Nations and the ICRC have uh, uh, are, are keep as, as stewards. Uh, in terms of what affects uh, what I'm going to call destructive cyber operations uh, has, uh, destructive cyber operations, which do something bad to your computer uh, can do two things. They can affect people and they can affect machines that are attached to these uh, computers. The people uh, part is when you can trick a computer into giving wrong information and so somebody takes action on the basis of wrong information and, and does something that he, sh he or she sh shouldn't be doing. Uh, similarly with a, a machine, you can compromise the computer that's controlling the machine which can be um, a missile or a car or a pacemaker or your smartphone or that camera over there or anything uh, into, you, into doing bad things uh, which they shouldn't be doing. Sometimes those bad things include things like blowing up and uh, destroying things and, and uh, killing people. So there are certainly bad things that, that can happen there. But if it were, if it were not for the fact that we couple computers to everything now, which we don't have to do. I mean, there was a world in which all these things existed without the computer. Uh, if it weren't for that coupling, then it, there would be no effect really on people. So it's the coupling of the physical, uh, physical artifacts to the computer that creates the destructive potential that's inherent in, in that, that, that gives rise to IHL kinds of concerns. 
Well, great. Um, I think <laughs> it's, it's really helpful for us to understand kind of that this is not just um, an isolation, it's, a, it's an interactive effect with the technology in human society. Um, but I, I think all of this is also premised on a understanding or at least um, maybe an, an ambiguous understanding right now as to what constitutes an attack. Um, in cyber warfare. So the Tallinn Manual that has been widely disseminated the world over has a very specific definition of attack, um, which it seems to me, um, and I can ask Laurent to explain the, the distance between the ICRC's position on the definition of attack and the Tallinn Manual's view of uh, a definition of attack, because if there's no, um, there's daylight between the two, which may give rise to ambiguities as to still what causes um, a right to wage war in response. So please. Thank you for the question. I think that's a very, very important point. Um, and I've, before going into the definition, I want to clarify what I'm talking about by attack and cyber attack, because as uh, Duco was referring before, so for cyber warfare, it has been used in very different ways to mean different things, and we need to be precise on what we mean when we use those terms and cyber attack have been used for any kind of uh, purposes. So I think what you refer to here, uh, Heather, is uh, the notion of attack as it is understood within the law of armed conflict. So it has nothing to do with an armed attack under the UN Charter. It has all to do with how you conduct hostilities. The conduct of hostilities is based on the principle of distinction, proportionality and precautions and those principle applies primarily to attack in the legal sense. So you need to define what is an attack to know how to apply the principle of distinction, proportionality, and precaution in the first place. The debate has been about functionality of objects, a cyber operation which leads directly to killing somebody, as you mentioned, through, for example, disrupting your, the person's pacemaker if it's linked to internet, and you kill the person, everybody agrees that's an attack in that sense. Uh, um, same if it leads to injury, same if it leads to physical damage, I think there is uh, agreement generally on that. The debate has been if uh, cyber operations lead only to a loss of functionality of an object. And there have been various views uh, uh, in the group uh, leading to the Tallinn Manual. There have been lots of debates. Originally, there were, uh, I mean, the views did not merge at the end. There were still a diverging position at the end, but the majority of the experts eventually agreed that some form of loss of functionality amount to damage, uh, uh, and therefore that a cyber operation, which would lead to a loss of functionality, is an attack and therefore that you have to apply the principle of distinction, proportionality and precaution before launching such a cyber operation. There is debate in the commentary of which kind of loss of functionality would amount uh, to an attack, I mean, depending on what you have to do to restore functionality. In our view, it's immaterial uh, how uh, the loss of functionality occur, whether it's through destruction or uh, through, I mean, if your object no longer functions, that's what is important and that's what the law has been uh, uh, created for. It's to uh, uh, make sure that human beings can still uh, use uh, the object. And if it's for a computer, if you cannot use it any longer, whether it's destroyed or it's just dysfunctional, change nothing for you. So in our view, uh, uh, loss of functionality count as a damage and therefore a cyber operation which would be uh, intended to only lead to a loss of functionality without physical damage have to respect the rules on the conduct of hostilities. There's a, still an ongoing debate, um, I think, within the cyber community about how difficult it is once we even, so if we, we witness an attack, a loss of functionality, property damage, loss of life, things of this nature, bodily injury, um, there's still an, another problem on the table before us, right, which is who launched the attack. Um, and so even if we can become clear on whether or not and understand whether an attack is the ICRC's definition, and that's the one we want to accept that includes loss of functionality along with property damage, loss of life, and bodily injury, or we want to be more restrictive um, on the Tillin Manual's definition, um, we still have to figure out attribution of who, who launched the attack. And so I think this is a new difficulty, right? And I'd actually like to pose this question to Duco, which is, you know, how, how do governments really handle this ability to, um, and the difficulties in attributing uh, 
responsibility for cyber attacks, in particular attributing in a timely manner, right? So here's another one, right? It's another layer of complexity is that cyber forensics take time. So how do governments attribute in a timely manner the origin of attack um, and how that might affect a government's decisions um, to either respond at all um, or maybe escalate or um, what type of response is appropriate given the time lag that it takes to figure out any, any sort of attribution question. So can you explain for us kind of the political minefield that results with problems of attribution? Um, well, the, the, the truly honest answer is um, we've, we've fortunately never had to do that, so we're, we're not entirely sure. Um, what, what would happen in, in practice is, um, at least taking my own country as an example, um, we, we do have a, a fairly well-organized sort of defensive system against cyber attacks in the broadest sense, not necessarily IHL attack, um, where any major incident targeting, whether it be the government, whether it be um, vital infrastructure, whether it be um, Facebook, um, would be reported to the sort of national hub uh, of, of cybersecurity, um, a, a, a CERT type organization, which has links with the police, with the military, with the intelligence community, with the private sector. Um, they would, in the case of, of, of a serious cyber incident, get straight to work doing all sorts of cyber defense stuff. Um, firewalls, patching, uh, disconnecting networks, whatever, um, which doesn't really require a legal framework because it's your own network and you can do what you want. Um, at the same time, and here's the problem because yeah, that does take time, um, you would also try and figure out what just happened and what just hit you. Um, in the case of a major incident, um, the or national crisis structure, however exactly that was organized, um, that will differ per country, will we'll presumably get together and say, well, you know, we, they just shut off all the lights in our country, now what? Um, and as information comes in, um, then you can start to think, and this is a, a political issue as well, on what your response should be. And you have a very broad range of responses as a government. Um, it can be from you know, sending the police to um, write a very angry letter to country X, um, asking them to you know, please make that stop, um, to um, doing countermeasures in, in cyber, or, or in fact, um, if, if you fancy doing that sort of thing. Yep, still, yep. Um, or at the sort of extreme range of the spectrum, um, send a cruise missile to take out the um, server that is attacking you. Um, many of, the, and, but in order to make that choice, you, you need to have a, a better idea of, of what just happened, what just hit you, where did that come from? And even if you can make the assessment that this is in fact an armed attack, I now have the right under the UN Charter to act in self-defense, um, well, that's good for you. If you don't know who to punch back, that doesn't help you very much. Um, so there is, there is, fr from a legal point of view, a distinction between noting that I've just been hit by an armed attack, uh, yay, I now have self-defense. Um, if I don't know who did it or where they came from, then that doesn't help me at all. Um, so the, the, the reality of the matter would, I think, be that um, it will take a couple of hours to perhaps a couple of days um, for a government to truly respond in, well, uh, apart from the defensive measures, which will go into, which will start almost immediately as, as soon as you, people can, can log in, um, that, that will go quick. That will go quickly. Um, but the, the response will, will not be instant. Um, and as I said, having a bad day with this. Um, but as, as I said, this is, that's where the difficulty lies. Um, and and we'll, we'll hope, we, hope we won't have to um, make it up as too much when, if and when this actually does happen. So this kind of 
the the hypotheticals and the, the forward the kind of counterfactual reasoning that we're doing right now because we've never really seen a cyber attack and we've never really seen a state respond um, a large scale cyber attack um, that's the types of worries that get kind of produced in the media and since we haven't seen one of these happen and we haven't then witnessed a, a government response to this leads me to kind of technical questions right which is what's the technical lot what's the what's possible right what's possible technologically um, what's possible in terms of the forensics so that we could actually start to understand attribution better um, and to that I'd actually like to pose a question to herb about you know what are our technological capacities for cyber forensics and how do you see the future kind of playing out in that direction well an attacker that wants to attack you and stay anonymous should do a number of things so he should use techniques that he's never done before, he's never used before. He should use, uh, he should not talk about it to anybody. He should, that is, he should uh, practice perfect operational security. Uh, he shouldn't leave any clues behind, so leaving leftover files around and, and, and so on. Um, and he shouldn't make any demands. Uh, and if all of those conditions are, are met, it's going to be mighty hard to identify the, uh, uh, the perpetrator. Uh, especially on a t very tor short time scale. But, in fact, attackers do make mistakes, and they do leave behind clues, and they do use techniques that have been used in the past. So it will take some time. You may not be able to identify him the first time, but you may be able to identify him on the seventh time after you've built up evidence from, all, from the six preceding attempts uh, to do bad things to you. And if you're not faced with the need to retaliate or to respond immediately, then you have a much better chance of uh, responding in a pinpointed, in a pinpointed way. That is, with with high, much higher, with much higher confidence. So the question that I have is really a technical guy going to throw, a, throw it back to the political people, which is, why do you need to respond promptly? And that's an interesting question. Sometimes there are political imperatives to need to respond promptly, but at least in the case of the United States, with which, whose cases I'm most familiar with, we've always responded. We've always said we respond the right, we, we reserve the right to respond in a time and a place and a manner of our own choosing. Uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't put any time limits on, on how long it will take. Uh, so there is no particular reason, in my view, that you have to necessarily respond instantly under all circumstances. So the answer is in, in terms of, of uh, the, the desire to remain anonymous versus the desire to be uh, on the other side to attribute, that's going to run back and forth depending on, it's a, that's the pendulum will swing back and forth depending on the circumstances uh, uh, at any given time uh, and the particulars of, of what they're trying to do. Um, if I may just make the point, um, there is certainly cyber forensics play a part, but as you said, the ideal hacker leaves no demands, makes no idea, then, there, then there's really not that much point unless you're very nihilist. Um, generally speaking, any, any attack coming your way does serve a purpose. Right, and, and if um, he tells, and if he tells, if he's moving, if he wants to make a demand of you and, and says, you know, if you don't do X, then I'm going to continue attacking you, well, then you know where the demand is coming from. Well, that, 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 that would be a pretty decent hint where it came right, from. Certainly. Right, right, and and and, uh, and so I mean, so there are times when you, in order to achieve their political goals, the attacker has to come, has to claim credit. So the yes, it may be true that in some idealized vacuum state where there, there's no other context and so on, and this it's very very hard. But in the real world, it probably is a lot easier than people give it credit for. And uh, I, I do have to make the point that sort of the assessment of, of attribution is is an all source assessment. You you don't just go sifting through the code and see if if there's any signature there. Um, it really depends on the context, on the political situation. Um, if there's an ongoing shooting war, that might be a bit of a hint as well. Right. Um, there there's there's many many factors, and in the end, you can probably never be one hundred percent sure. Um, but. Um, at, at some point, given the big enough crisis, then good enough is probably good enough. I'd actually like to follow up on this, this thread because um, Dr. Longhi's work in international relations and international security, right? Um, most international relations scholars look at war as 
kind of a bargaining model, right? And so you, you, you give information, you get information, and where sometimes results because of either a problem of, of information. But in this instance, right, what we're talking about is someone waging attacks without making demands, potentially, right? Then that would be you know, making attribution more difficult. So what do you see as a strategic, why would somebody um, on a kind of a, a political international relations strategic vision, why would someone engage in cyber attacks if, um, if it makes bargaining and everything else completely impossible? Um, it's just harm for harm's sake. Uh, uh, why uh, is this kind of uh, uh, attacks uh, happen? Uh, uh, rather than using the, the, the word of cyber attack, uh, personally, I prefer to use cyber activities. And before talking about the cyber attack, I think we should uh, 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 clarify what kind of uh, cyber activities are going on on the internet. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, there are um, different people have different uh, 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 clarifications or ca uh, characterizations of the cyber activities. Some say there is cyber, there is cyber terrorism, terrorism. Some say there is cyber uh, crime. And some say, will say some uh, cyber warfare. Uh, so uh, from this different kind of uh, categorization, we can see, uh, we can just uh, have kind of guesswork about uh, why the attack will have this kind of uh, cyber activities. Uh, I think uh, personally, there, there are some uh, different um, uh, motives behind this kind of uh, cyber activities. Uh, firstly, uh, during the early period of the uh, the appearance after uh, after the appearance of the internet, uh, most uh, most cyber uh, activities uh, or, or attacks are out of personal curiosity or personal interest. For example, a teacher can sign a homework to a student, uh, especially in the computer science department. Uh, if you can take down, uh, if you can deface a, a website, then y your coursework will be passed and get a Great, right? Uh, it, uh, uh, this is the, the early period, and uh, most of the cyber activities or cyber attacks of this kind during the early period are of this are to show demonstrate one's uh, cyber talents, cyber skill. So, and of course, there are some other, for example, a lot of uh, uh, acti uh, activities and competitions going on between different uh, <coughs> companies, especially uh, in the field of uh, in the community of uh, business. Uh, different uh, companies will compete uh, for a bid to 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 win uh, in a bid. So there are a lot of uh, kind of uh, this cyber tests going on between uh, these different corporations. Uh, what is the purpose between between this kind of uh, uh, behavior? Of course, to get the to 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 outwin the the competitors and to get uh, what they are doing. And of course, there is another uh, kind of. Uh, uh, activity maybe uh, uh, or motive that is uh, a kind of uh, cyber activity conducted by state actors. Uh, of course, <laughs> uh, with regard to this uh, uh, kind of behavior, uh, there, will, there will be always multiple, there will be no single motives. There must be, must be a lot of various motives behind of this kind of activities. So with various motives behind potentially state uh, launched attacks, um, which may be hard to disaggregate because we have problems of attribution. And if we have problems of attribution, we have problems of discerning motives, which may then be uh, a messy situation uh, when it comes to diplomacy. Um, that's the outward looking way to think about cyber. And I'd actually like to think about it again on the inward looking way, but too, which is given that these, these types of questions are extremely difficult um, from a uh, diplomatic and a legal um, and a moral standpoint, um, what can states do in the interim, given that these are kind of pervasive problems at the moment? So what might states do uh, to protect their civilian populations, given that they may be attacked and they may not be able to um, respond right away um, or take a, an offensive measure, defensive measure um, back? So I'd like to pose the question actually to to each of the panelists to figure out what you think that the um, that the state's obligations may be to their civilian populations um, 
to control to um, to, to protect them under under some sort of hostility cyber cyber hostilities. So maybe Laurent, you could kick us off on that one. Okay, so <clears throat> again, I'm going to talk about only the situation where it's within an armed conflict and not what states can do to protect their citizens in general or their companies in general against cyber uh, hostile uh, operations. So, but really when, it, when it's the question of uh, the law of armed conflict. And the law of armed conflict among, uh, within the principle of uh, precaution is the obligation to uh, take precaution against the effect of attacks. That means separating military objective from civilians, uh, removing <clears throat> military objective from uh, populated places, and take any kind of precautionary measures to uh, try to protect your population. What does, would that mean in terms of cyber? I think that's certainly a domain which has been uh, underlooked at until now. Uh, one of the main problems in cyber is that you have one cyberspace which is entirely used for uh, uh, both military and civilian purposes. So that would raise the question whether network segregation is feasible, whether a physical segregation of the network between military networks and civilian networks is feasible. If it's not done, is it because of costs? Is it because it's physically impossible? Or whether it's for other reason and have any thoughts been given to that? Whether a virtual segregation would be enough, and here I maybe turn to the uh, uh, technical expert, which I'm not, to know whether virtual separation is already done, what does that, what does that mean, what, to what extent does that help uh, to protect uh, civilian networks. And then there have been recently, and I think that's important, a big trend on protecting critical infrastructure. I don't think that states see that uh, under the lens of uh, the law of armed conflict and protecting against the effect of attack, but that's actually something which is very important, that a state have to take measures and take measures in advance to ensure that uh, the water delivery to the population can remain despite the fact that there would be a cyber attack. And in terms of cyber, that means uh, what states are trying to do now uh, uh, to protect their critical infrastructure. So certainly there are things that states can reflect on uh, uh, and hopefully not only reflect but uh, move on in terms of uh, protecting the, I mean, first the most critical infrastructure, water, electricity, etc., that is necessary for the people uh, uh, when they, I mean, against the effects of uh, attack in warfare. If you could follow up with that, because I think there is this kind of question of technical capacity. Can you actually separate these things out so that um, the networks are uh, less prone to dual-use attacks? Sure. Uh, in, in the limiting case, uh, you can have completely separate networks where you put all of your critical infrastructure on, for example, uh, and take them off of the what you would call the public internet. Every proposal that has ever been thought of that I know of to implement such a separate network fails because not, not for technical reasons, but for one, for economic reasons, it's very costly to do that. The reason, internet, the reason that power companies and water companies and, and so on want to run on the internet is that it's cheap and, and the, the, the costs of sending communications along the internet are very much lower than they are to send them along a, to create a private, uh, a, a private network. So there's no uh, incentive uh, to move to the private network in the absence of somebody saying, this is something that you, that, that you must do. Furthermore, to the extent that you want to integrate the services that you provide uh, in critical infrastructure to the public, you're naturally going to turn to the public internet. And so if you think about a smart grid uh, that will help you ha help end users monitor their energy usage and turn on their electricity at night when the rates are lower to charge up their cars or to do their laundry or whatever, you need to connect to the public internet. And so now you have a, a connection between your secure internet and your public internet. And that's, you, we can argue about whether you can make that secure, but arguably connecting them makes it much, makes your secure internet much less secure. So it really is a question of, of costs and convenience, and you have to be willing to give up those costs and convenience if you want to maintain the, the, the kind of separation that uh, you think, you, the, that you think is, is desirable. 
today we have military communications running on the internet. A large fraction of military communications run on the internet. Could you do it separately? Sure, but you, the militaries would pay a lot more money on the communication side, and it's not clear that certainly in, in the United States we, we would not be willing to do that at this point. Uh, Duco, how, how would you follow up from the state perspective on this, right? The, the, the Herb's charge that states just aren't willing to, to pay the costs to uh, kind of protect their, their civilians from being, a, or their civilian infrastructure from being a legitimate military target. Um, well, there's, there's a, a number of, of facets to that. For one, um, yeah, sure, uh, money is tight. And if you would put all your military communications via whole, wholly separate networks, then that would be prohibitive, prohibitively expensive. Um, that, that's one. Um, on the other hand, I mean, there are separate military networks, especially Purposes, for the, especially, and they cost a lot more. Yeah, especially for the highly classified ones, but um, just the regular emails I sent, um, I send are sent over the regular internet. Um, so yeah, there is certainly a matter of cost. Um, and on the other hand, um, your vital infrastructure is, is usually not, which is a, a good way of hitting at a state, in fact, hitting at a military. If you, know, you run out of water, run out of electricity, run out of fuel, whatever, um, then we have pretty much the same problem as if we run out of ammunition. Um, so if, if you would take this to the extreme, then you would also need to have an, another separate um, network for the vital infrastructure that could possibly be supportive to your military activities. Then another one, which is just for the civilians, we have to have two different water companies. Um, it, it, um, th there comes a level where it's just not going to be practical. Um, now, if, if you talk about what are the obligations as a state, um, Laurent spoke of, you know, just in the case of, of IHL, um, fortunately, this is one of those areas where just day-to-day -day life and, and misery um, joins in quite well with IHL, um, because what, what governments should do, and in fact usually do, is we, we do try and work on cybersecurity. Um, you, you try and have you know, promotional campaigns to, to, to get people to buy antivirus. Um, you do have uh, a whole network of certs, be they military, be they civilian, um, both from the public and the private sector, to, to try and keep everything running. And that defends, um, I mean, it's mostly designed to defend against crime and just generic IT mishaps, which also just occur. Um, but that also has a, an effect to protect the population uh, against attacks in, in an IHL setting, incidentally also to protect ourselves, of course, um, as a military, uh, which is a wonderful side effect, but um, just the, the general resilience of your infrastructure, both civilian and government, is something that governments are working on. Um, but there is always a limit to the means that you can put in there. And of course, there's a couple of the obvious things, you know, don't put a military data center in a historical building with a blue shield. You know, that's, that's fairly clear. Um, a, couple of, a couple of other um, um, obvious things like that, but a, a, a true separation, I, I don't think is, is feasible anymore. DJ, how do you how would you respond to this from the kind of the just war side of things if there is no possibility of really separating things out? Right. Well, yeah. So a couple points on that. Well, first, I think you're suffering a cyber attack on your microphone down there. So watch out. Um, I think that uh, state responsibility to protect its citizens from harm is is really interesting when we get to the cyber realm because it's funny how we view it differently. Right. You just mentioned that. Um, you know, there might be a campaign to encourage people to buy their own antivirus, right? It's interesting in the United States, I'm not sure exactly how it is for other countries, but the Department of Defense in the United States, they spend a great deal of money and time and effort on uh, cybersecurity measures to protect their own cyber assets. But interestingly, they, they don't spend much effort trying to protect your average citizens. And in conventional warfare, we would not have this intuition at all, whether it's warfare or cyber crime. Um, imagine if um, somebody was somehow trying to you know, break into a Walmart and just steal some money. Well, we would presumably say that the local police should have some involvement in helping that 
stop from that happening. We wouldn't say, well, that's Walmart's problem. Similarly, if, uh, if there was a cruise missile coming out of the sky from some other country and landed into a Walmart, we would assume that the state has some responsibility to protect that Walmart. But notice with cyber how different it is. If, uh, if there's a cyber criminal stealing money somehow through some tricky little hack move into Walmart servers and take some money from this corporation, it's unclear that the state says, oh, our responsibility is to protect you from that crime. Although I think they should. So morally here is, I think, the mor is a big distinction between the moral and the legal here. And I think there's a moral responsibility on states to take this seriously, the same way they try to protect their citizens from any harm. The cruise missile story sounds, of course, silly. If you imagine a cruise missile coming in and hitting a, a local business, of course, the state's military is going to call to arms. But if a cyber attack of some type coming from some other state goes after some corporation, uh, if, a, if a DDoS attack goes after Amazon, right, and, and costs them an equivalent amount of money that maybe a missile blowing up one of their warehouses would have, we don't seem to think that the military should rush to arms to block that DDoS attack. It, it doesn't seem like it's the same uh, relationship, at least in the main social consciousness. We, we, t we tend to say, boy, Amazon, they better get their cybersecurity measures up. But we wouldn't say that with other things. So, so I guess my point is that I think we should. I think morally, a state has an obligation to protect its citizens, its businesses from cyber harm. Uh, obviously, I'm talking lower than armed conflict, but also obviously in armed conflict, just as they would with conventional. But yet, we don't see that. Yeah, I actually wanted to, to give the, the floor really quickly to Zhu, because um, as some as a researcher in China, right, we do face the fact that China, I think, takes that obligation quite seriously, and so has a, uh, it has a it has the Great Firewall as a, as a way of disconnecting, right, because of the potential threat. So maybe you could speak to something like that. Uh, uh, with regard to the uh, state uh, resp uh, responsibility to protect the citizens in cyberspace, uh, I think different people from different countries with different cultures or, and the religions background, maybe we have different understandings. Uh, here, I, uh, I'd just like to pr uh, put forward my own ideas from a, a, a academic point of view. Uh, firstly, I think uh, the government can do several things uh, of, uh, in several dimensions or aspects. Firstly, the Governments should uh, enact or make uh, laws, uh, make policies and uh, strategies concerning cyber issues, concerning cyber security. Uh, this is the, first, uh, the highest level, th that is on the st strategic level, the government has to uh, show its resp responsibility to make uh, kind of uh, uh, policies, uh, overall uh, st strategies uh, over cyber security. And second uh, point is uh, technological, uh, 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 technologically, the, the government should create a kind of environment for the companies to, to, make, uh, to invest in uh, uh, computer science and technologies in, in ICTs uh, to make the cyberspace safe. Uh, except the policy aspect, I think the personally, and the most important part will be technological part. Without technology, uh, without computer scientists, uh, there will be no security to, to mention at all. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, this is the second part, uh, second aspect of government's res responsibility to uh, protect the citizens. And second, uh, third, of course, uh, which is the, also very important, that is uh, the legal aspect. As, as now we know, there is a lot of different uh, variety, uh, uh, kinds of cyber uh, online activities. But a large uh, proportion or a majority of the uh, online activities are cyber crime. Uh, and uh, the cyber crime is becoming uh, increasingly severe, especially in recent years, and causes a, a large amount of losses every year to to, to people, to corporations, and to the country. Uh, so the, uh, the state, uh, the government should uh, uh, make laws, enact uh, laws. For example, uh, now a lot of countries have, uh, have such kind of laws as uh, electronic signature, uh, laws of electronic evidence, and so on. I think uh, uh, this kind of laws will uh, play a very important role in combating uh, cyber crime and protects the, uh, the interests of, the, of, of their uh, citizens. And the uh, last uh, but not least importance is that, uh, you see, especially uh, in, the, uh, in the developing countries, 
uh, now every day, uh, uh, more and more people uh, having access to the internet, uh, but uh, uh, especially in the de developing countries, but a, lot, a large proportion of them are just first time users and the green hands, they have no awareness of uh, what kind of uh, threats are behind, uh, are behind their uh, serving uh, uh, online activities. So uh, they just have no awareness. So uh, in, this, uh, in this aspect, the government should have play a role to educate, to, uh, to raise the awareness of the, their citizens. This is very, very important. Uh, for example, if a citizen itself, uh, himself or herself does not upgrade the, uh, the, the antivirus uh, database, uh, make patches to his uh, own, uh, any, uh, of, uh, if, a per if a, an individual does not make patches to his computer, it's r really very easy uh, to suffer from attack. But if he has this kind of awareness, cyber threat awareness, and, uh, and if the government can play a role in raising this kind of awareness, this will be greatly, uh, 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 the, 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 the level of security will be greatly improved and uh, uh, their interests will be better protected. Uh, that's my idea. Um, yeah, I, I, I have to, to agree. Um, to, to a certain extent, certainly the, the, the state has a responsibility uh, to protect its citizens, be it from crime, be it from armed attack. Um, however, if, if I take your parallel, I, I would say that encouraging people to get their own software um, patch um, is more equivalent to expecting them to have a lock on the door. Um, you know, given the fact that there is crime, you can expect Walmart to at least have a lock on the door. We're not going to put a policeman in front of every building. Um, for the simple fact, you know, that that simply cannot be done, and it's it's sort of a layered defence. You can expect a, a certain level of self-sufficiency from your citizens, from your private sector, and once that escalates, then there are um, private certs, there are government certs, and in in the ultimate scenario, indeed. Can you explain that for the audience? Who doesn't oh, I'm sorry. The 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 cert is a computer emergency response team. I have no idea what they do because I'm a lawyer by training and I have very few, I have little practical skill, but they tell me they're sort of the imperial stormtroopers amongst IT guys. Um, they are um, sort of the, they, they come in when there is a, a massive IT problem, which can be man-made or just a, a, a technical slip up. Um, it, it's sort of the ambulance, the fire service, if you will, for cyber situations. Um, that's as much as I understand, and I'm sure her right. completely so, disagree with me. No, there, but um, but there, there, there is a layer, and um, even the, the example, we, we've had discussions with our civilian authorities, um, you know, you, you have to defend us against a cyber attack. Well, to a certain extent, if you, if you draw the parallel to, to the, the civilian world, um, Sure, if there is an incoming cruise missile or an incoming bomber, um, then it's the job of the military um, to shoot that thing down. Um, however, if that accidentally fails, um, it's still up to well, both private persons and civilian authorities to put out the fires to, to do the ambulance. It's not suddenly because you are in an armed conflict situation that everything has to be done by the military. No, I, well, as I agree, just a real quick point. I, I didn't mean to say that encouraging citizens to take their own individual precaution was somehow wrong of the state. And of course, you could just say that the way the state encourages them to do that is a form of the state protecting its citizens kind of through proactive help. My point is simply that I think this balance between, you know, uh, how much is the homeowner responsible for putting out fires herself versus how much do we want to rely on the fire department, it might be mismatched in cyber compared to other ways. And I think maybe the state needs to take on uh, more of its moral duty in this regard. Just to give another analogy the other direction, again, in the U.S., and perhaps it's different in other, in other states, I'm sure it is, but in the United States, the Department of Defense spends a great deal of resources protecting their own cyber assets right, incredibly well. But they don't really use those resources to protect uh, civilian and business uh, s cyber assets from external attack. Um, they kind of just tell the businesses, hey, you have to take care of that yourself. And a, a silly picture of that would be like, imagine a giant aircraft carrier, of a Navy fleet, who the, the only reason it exists is to protect itself from attack, 
Right? That would be very strange, right? We wouldn't we would think, hey, well, m you should use your abilities to protect and block cyber attacks for everyone for other in the state, not just for your own resources. So I, I agree with the point, but yeah, perhaps the duty is higher than states realize, I guess. But that's by policy. That is the, the, the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, and, sorry, the, the American people have said, we don't want the United States Department of Defense, right. the military, defending our, you know, intruding into our networks and, and, and quote, protecting us and, and, and so on. We, that, there's great resistance to, to that idea. So it's not that the military per se is reluctant to, to, to do this. It does, it does what it's been told to do by, you know, on, on, by, by law. Okay, I'm so going to call moderator privilege and not make it about a U.S. foreign policy or domestic policy debate. Um, just okay, the, can not... I make a point that, that that's <laughs> di that's di that, that on, on the the dilemma that BJ uh, addresses is is most stark when you consider the fact that the U.S. Department of Defense has said it's willing to conduct offensive operations in cyberspace for defensive purposes for protecting U.S. military assets in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. Military assets only, that's right. Which is, is an interesting question. Is there another entity that's willing to conduct similar offensive operations to protect the private sector? And that question is completely unresolved. My microphone too. There's actually a question from the audience and I would encourage um, if you do have questions, I think we've got some good ideas on the table um, that you know, if you start thinking about this and we can start opening up more questions to the audience. But um, David, please. No. Is that, um, Hold it up to your mouth. <laughs> is that uh, citizens um, have rights to be protected not only from attack by enemy governments, but also from attack and harm by their own state. So that's implicit in responsibility to protect and many other instruments of international law and theory. And as you've brought out in the discussion, a, um, a cyber attack against civilian networks could certainly be considered to be a regulated kind of attack under IHL. And one of the panelists mentioned, for example, an attack against a civilian Um, a state leader like President Erdogan or President Putin threatening, for example, to shut down Facebook or Twitter. Or if you think about the attempt by uh, Assad in the Latvia regular region to shut down the Russian And the question is, do we view these as forms of cyber attack by states against their own population that is regulated under relevant um, international law, and could we ever envisage a situation in which these kinds of attacks could potentially be um, the kinds of activities that could trigger an international responsibility to protect? Given the, the, given the definition used under IHL that Laurent gave before about the fact of loss of functionality. Correct. I'm going to interrupt the five seconds to remind uh, everyone both in the audience and on the panel to speak as close as possible in the microphones and straight in the microphones too. Thank you. Whoever wants to take this, because I think it's a fascinating question. I, I don't have an answer to it, but just on the R2P point, I mean, it's a very interesting point, right? It, if we are going to, if you take the state responsibility that I was just speaking of to protect its own citizens, and then if you if you buy into uh, the responsibility to protect doctrine, as I, as I find quite plausible, then you could imagine, could we have cases where one state would be justified in intervening in another state's affairs on how they govern their own cyber policy because it's viewed that their cyber policy is uh, a type of attack or harm, at least, on its own citizens. Now, I, I don't think the kind of things you describe would qualify as an attack, certainly. Uh, I could be wrong. I don't think they would be an attack because there wouldn't be the destruction of property and there wouldn't be these kinds of things. It would be, be limiting access. But depending on how you understand an individual's right 
to expression and to freedom of speech and to these kinds of things, uh, depending on how you take seriously you know, some recent movement to say that the access to the internet itself is a human right, then certainly it seems that in theory, the ground is there that you could invoke an R2P clause to intervene in another state to prevent its own cyber policy against its own people. That seems a little wild, but it, it, doesn't seem, it doesn't seem impossible, I guess would be what I'd say. But I'd, I think the reason is I think the threshold of harm would probably be too low. But in principle, I think it's there. Does anybody else want to take this? Laura? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, you mentioned that, uh, that uh, in China now we uh, <laughs> cannot access to the Facebook or Twitter. But uh, do you know in China we have a uh, similar app application called WeChat? It carries similar or same functions as Twitter or Facebook. And uh, as far as I know, more and more people, foreign, foreigners, are using WeChat. So how can you say that we are limiting the access to the internet? Right, and, and that's a great response. I mean, you could say, you're going to have to define here, is it, do you need the specific, oh, you need, <laughs> you need to give people the right to Facebook particularly? Or is it that, as, as, as she's making the point, you, is, is there maybe an argument to be said that you need to give people certain access, that maybe that that's a right they can demand? But if that's the case, maybe it doesn't have to take one form versus another. And I think that's a very plausible response to say that we are meeting a demand. If you think that is a demand, there's ways that they could say they're meeting it, a state could. So that'd be a very difficult argument to make against any state for that reason. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, yeah, there's another question in the audience, but as someone who actually studies R2P, um, and if we're gonna be legal sticklers, uh, there's only four crimes that trigger R2P instances, right? So ethnic cleansing, genocide, war crimes, things of this nature. So um, loss of functionality, and, and they have to be large scale and massive. But that doesn't go under R2P, but, um, but it's, a, it's a good exercise to start thinking about when we start taking the definition of attack as, as a loss of functionality. Sir, please. Um, I'm sorry I came late, so I didn't hear how this whole debate started, uh, but I uh, think that the emphasis exclusively on the defense really uh, misses to some extent uh, the point. Because obviously when we talk about uh, uh, conflict and armed conflict, uh, we are also concentrating the, on the act of violence of war. And so the qu first question is, before we talk about who should defend whom, is who is attacking whom and what is considered to be an act of war, an act of violence, which then obviously can have a justified response. So in this context, I find it quite, I mean, neutrality has its limits. But I mean, you have read probably, as I've had and all of us, the issue of the Chinese U.S. accusations of Chinese uh, direct attacks on, on uh, foreign uh, cyber facilities, let's call it that, that way. And the uh, argument, the way it comes out from the New York Times, is that we have not done it, but if, you know, uh, you are worse, it's the, the, the uh, same kind of arguments that the Soviets used to use, uh, well, uh, you know, the Americans should not uh, 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 talk about human rights in the Soviet Union because uh, there is not no full integration in the uh, in the United States. So there is no clear statement and uh, what really is the Chinese position, what constitutes a private crime or a minor crime or what is considered to be the area that we can do. Now the second point here is very important, is that cyber also means not just disturbing, but also supporting. Uh, that means uh, if you are supporting, allowing through your cyber facilities, hostile behavior by another state, say Syria, uh, 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 airspace, uh, North Korean, uh, Missile tests, North Korean, uh, North Korean uh, nuclear tests, which obviously uh, have a very important cyber dimension, and these are 
are these considered to be normal things or are these uh, considered uh, things that can be seen as a hostile attack either by the Japanese or by the international community as a whole? Thank you. Anybody want to go? I, I, I can take try that, that last one a, a little bit. The, an interesting case is that if country A wants to attack country B, but he has to route the attack through country C. Okay. What is the status of country C? So let's make country C Switzerland, <laughs> um, a, a neutral country. Uh, if I were flying, if I wanted to attack, if A wanted to attack C, C with airplanes and wanted to fly over Swiss airspace, they would have to get permission, and the Swiss would say no. Okay, that's part of the tradition of neutrality. But if they want to use the communications facilities in Switzerland to route an attack. It turns out there is an international law about this, which says that if you let the, if you can use the, inter, uh, the communication facilities of a third party, of a neutral nation, freely to both sides, then it doesn't count as, uh, it doesn't count as a violation of neutrality. So the, then you have to ask the question, which is the better analogy, going over the, flying over the airspace or communications? And I don't know how to answer that. That's, that's, that's for a philosopher and a lawyer to, to, to decide, but that's the technical reality, that you have to make that sort of decision about how you want to treat that sort of thing. I also say that it's very difficult for A to say, I want my attack to go through to specify a particular route. It, I, don't, I don't really have control over that. It may go to here, it may go to here, and I just don't know where it goes. And it may tra traverse Switzerland completely inadvertently. And then that's a, that's a, that's a total mess. Yeah, Laurent, did you, did you maybe want to weigh in on the legal side? On, on the question of neutrality, I fully agree with you that uh, neutrality and cyberspace in terms, I mean, cyber warfare and neutrality creates uh, lots of problems because of the reason that uh, Herb so uh, well explained. And I think I share uh, the, your question and the debate, uh, I mean, the way you frame the debate uh, with regard to neutrality law. But I wanted to maybe come back on uh, the point of the, the last question and the, the emphasis on, uh, I mean, to keep emphasis on attack and again speaking from the perspective on an armed conflict and I would to, to not to simplify matter but I mean it is to be clear on what I'm talking about let's take a situation where you have uh, an ongoing armed conflict with uh, kinetic operations bomb uh, flying around um, and when you want to use a cyber operation to make um, disruptive activities, you have some additional, I mean, different concerns than there is with bombs, and that's related to the interconnectedness of uh, cyberspace. And that's why, that's one of the elements why we are concerned with the potential human cost of cyber warfare. The military potential of uh, cyber is not very clear, uh, and I would say all the better. That means it has not been used uh, or widely used for the time being. But uh, still, it appears that attack against dam or nuclear facility are technically possible, and that would obviously create um, an enormous amount of uh, casualties. But even if you want to try to do something more legally directed at a military objective, like disrupt the air control facility of your opponent to disrupt its air forces during the conflict, then how do you know that your attack against will not um, spread to other parts of the network, to civilian parts of the network, and disrupt flights, civilian flights, and lead to flights, uh, uh, civilian flights falling down? So how? because everything is interconnected in, um, uh, in cyber. Uh, so that's, that's why we are concerned, and I think the concern on the, on the side of the uh, attack is and the type of precaution you need to take before deciding to carrying out a cyber attack are extremely important. I'd actually like to, oh, did, Duca, did you have something? Um, so I'd actually like to talk about this too because there seems to be um, bright line cases of when we have an attack, either uh, we're in a state of hostilities and we understand that the law of, that IHL is governing, we're in this state, but there's also some ambiguity as to when that state might begin, given that we have um, a cyber attack that maybe is a loss of functionality um, or something that doesn't, um, 
maybe doesn't even rise to the threshold of an armed conflict, right? And so there's some serious ambiguity and gray area here. So I'd actually like to pose to each of the question, each of the panelists, you know, kind of what they think um, is a threshold, is a, is a threshold for the application of IHL, or or what is sub below that? Do we need physicality, perhaps? Do we need um, consequential damage? Do we is what what what's involved in this? Maybe we should unpack it. So maybe starting with BJ, if you could take that. Yes, yeah, so it's a great question. So there's a lot of, um, if it's a case like the one I was talking about, if it's a clear armed conflict already going on, where you have a, you know, you have a military operation and cyber uh, weaponry and cyber attacks are being used in conjunction with that, that's clearly an armed conflict. So we don't have any kind of confusion. But if there's a case where it's perhaps a very damaging cyber weapon launch, but let's say it's just launched against other cyber assets, so it's cyber to cyber, if you will, and there's no, you know, boom, there's no physicality. People wonder, you know, is that going to is that going to invoke Article 51, because there's no physicality to it. So this is an interesting metaphysical question, really. What is cyber, right? And we haven't really talked about the metaphysics in here, and don't worry, we won't for long, but I, I think it's an interesting question, and, and philosophers uh, disagree on this. Uh, I, there's actually a philosopher uh, who's written on this, um, Ryan Jenkins, actually, he's, uh, he's in the room. Uh, Professor Jenkins, I think, is over there, right? And he's, he's made a really good argument on this, and I, I agree with him, and I think he claims that, look, it is physical. It is physical because it's causal, first of all. It's a thing that has causality against other physical objects in some way, and it also exists in space and time. And so it depends how you define metaphysically what physicality means, what is physical, and any sort of good answer to that uh, in, in proper metaphysics is going to conclude that cyber Weapons, cyber attacks are physical. Now that does not mean, so I, I think they are physical, right? So I think that that's not gonna be a, a problem. People disagree on that. But that does not mean, of course, that a cyber attack necessarily will trigger the legal question of armed conflict because presumably, if we're talking about a cyber to cyber thing, we might not have any kind of secondary order effects of death or things like that. We might not have the kind of harm necessary for the legal uh, trigger to flip to armed conflict. But I think the physicality question, uh, although interesting, for this, for this domain, I think is the answer is yes, it is physical. But, but I'll leave the legal threshold question to Laurent and others. Let me give a, a, an example which to me is totally confusing in, the, in this space. Imagine a cyber attack conducted against electronic voting machines. Now, I'm not sure in, the, in Switzerland, are, 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 do you have electronic voting machines or do you vote on paper? I, I, I don't know, but in the United States and in many other uh, countries in, in the world, they're using electronic voting machines. By tampering with those electronic voting machines in cyberspace, one in principle could change the outcome of an election. No, no bombs, no bullets, nothing, nothing destroyed. But this, but, but this is clearly a, th th this is clearly not a friendly act. Uh, and, and so, does that count in any sense of the term as a? use of force or as, a, as an armed attack uh, or as anything that's a, a cause as Bella. And I don't know how to answer that one. I certainly don't know how to answer that one either because, <laughs> but because the ICRC is uh, focusing on in Bellow and not at Bellum issues and issues relating to whether it's an armed attack under Article 51 of the Charter or uh, use of force or threat of the use of force under Article 2 of the UN Charter are issues of ad bellum. What we look at is whether an act alone, because as um, um, BJ mentioned before, of course, if you have an ongoing armed conflict, IHL applies. But if it's only a cyber operation, whether this cyber operation might by itself uh, um, make that the Geneva Convention or the Hague Convention that you mentioned on neutrality uh, um, applies. I mean, or on the rules on the conduct of hostility, whether that applies. And the legal consequence, for example, would be that if uh, the operation is directed against civilian object uh, uh, and uh, or against a civilian person and uh, leads to civilian death, and that's uh, what you target. In addition to question of ad bellum, that maybe it's an armed attack, maybe there are other problems. In addition, that could be a war crime. If it doesn't meet the threshold of IHL, then uh, all those issues are moot. So we saw the two things being closely related. Of course, an armed attack will normally, I mean, what is considered an armed attack normally triggers the applicability of IHL. Now, 
we also see the question being separate in the sense that possibly IHL might be triggered by operation we do not amount to an armed attack in the sense of 51 of the Charter. Now it depends also how states understand an armed attack on the 51 because here you have a wi wide range of uh, views as well. But uh, so we see it rather in the terms of the scope of application of the law of armed conflict. And on that, I think there are clear cases if it's a uh, Mm, I mean, there are certainly some operations that I would expect, uh, and here I'm talking my uh, personal name because you said before I talk in the ICRC name, not always, <laughs> certainly. Uh, uh, the, uh, that I could imagine that you have uh, operation which by the magnitude of the effect, even if it's a cyber operation only, states would consider that this uh, amounts to an armed conflict by itself and trigger the application of uh, IHL. And, Mm, there are uh, other, and the debate is different than the debate I was mentioning before on the notion of attack under IHL, within IHL. Mm -hmm. uh, um, now, where is that threshold? And does every operation which lead to the loss of functionality of an object amount to, I mean, trigger the application of IHL without uh, uh, any other bombs? I, would imagine that this is not uh, what states would consider today, but that's certainly a matter which uh, states will have to somehow figure out and that we will figure out through state practice eventually. Uh, I have to uh, uh, respond very briefly to the senior gentleman's uh, uh, mentioning of China. Uh, I have to say that you are, it is really a pity that you are a victim of, of the news report you are misled and misguided, and you follow blindly about the report, rather than have a kind of independent thinking uh, of this kind of uh, accusations against China uh, about uh, cyber attacks against other countries. It is a great pity that we, uh, uh, the, the Chinese government's uh, position on this is uh, very clear. These kind of ac accusations will not work, and it's groundless, especially given the, the fact a very simple fact that attribution, that is traced back, who is the, who is the attacker is extremely difficult. Uh, but uh, from a, a, a expert's point of view, I'd like to uh, provide you some uh, uh, details. Uh, take the Mandiant report as an example. Uh, I, think, uh, I suppose that everybody here knows the Mandiant report released by the Mandiant group last year, right? Uh, uh, I'm sure that few people read into the, the report through, through, from beginning to the end. So a lot of uh, people are talking about and aside the report. I read into, I read through. Uh, I can tell you uh, two points. First, when I try to trace back the materials, the Chinese language materials used by the Mandiant report, Frankly speaking, I cannot find where does the materials come from. It simply cannot find it. So this report is less, uh, is less convincing, you know that. As a Chinese, uh, I know Chinese language. Uh, I trace back the material used, especially the phone notes. You can just uh, trace back the, the, the phone notes and find where does the material come from. Professor Longy, I, I actually but, uh, cut off the, the U.S. foreign policy and domestic policy debate, okay, so I'm going to cut off the Chinese one, too, just because this is an international discussion, okay, and I don't want it to be about state, um, particular state policy. Okay, so, uh, uh, One sentence, uh, very simple. Another issue is the report says the, the attack pattern is 9-5 attack began in morning at 9 o'clock and finished uh, at, in, uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning. Do you think the Chinese, if it is done by the Chinese attacker, do you think that the Chinese people is so stupid as to begin attack as, uh, as, uh, at 9 o'clock and finish at 5 o'clock every day? That's all. That's my idea. Um, when it comes to the... Um threshold of, 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 applica of, of application of IHL. Um, there, there's really two, two facets. There's the use ad bellum part and the use in bello uh, part. Um, we, uh, the Netherlands are of the opinion, but we, we've, um, I think we're a bit more enthusiastic than, than other countries about that. 
um, that it is possible for cyber to be an armed attack, not just if it has secondary effects that would equate to a kinetic attack. You know, clearly, the, the example that Laurent has given of um, a power plant or a dam, which we're pretty susceptible to, um, being below sea level, um, if, if that if that were to break, then, then clearly that I think there, there's very little argument that that can be an armed attack. Um, we've, we've taken that one step further, where um, a cyber attack which leads to well, loss, loss of functionality, not so much of Facebook or whatever, but if, if that truly threatens the existence of a state, if, if you're no longer able to, to provide your government function um, at all, um, for you know, more than half a day just because you have problems with Microsoft. Um, but, but for any serious duration of time, then we, we may consider that to be an armed attack, which gives us the right to act in self-defense. Of course, we won't have any communications, so that will be hard in practice, but, um, but that, that's a theory anyway. Um, when it comes to not so much one giant attack triggering um, an armed conflict. I mean, it, it, it's hard to foresee anything that we would qualify as an armed attack, as in UN Charter Article 51, to not um, to not be sufficient to, to trigger an armed conflict and thus invoke IHL. Um, that, that's almost inconceivable, I think. Um, as for the, the other way around, to have a number of, of cyber incidents which which all don't quite qualify as an attack, you're not quite sure, um, but if you have dozens or thousands or millions of them, that, does that finally reach above that, that threshold of, of, of violence? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and, and one final point um, to just draw away from IHL again, for which I apologize, uh, Laura. Um, there are many conceivable situations where, um, as a state, you will be under a um, cyber activity, um, un unfriendly cyber activity, to, to avoid the word attack, um, where the normal legal framework, uh, human, human rights, uh, criminal law, uh, international cooperation in, in criminal matters, which is um, doesn't always function as well as it should. Um, there are situations conceivable where, as a, as a state, you are sufficiently uh, harmed in your interests uh, that you may indeed take actions, call them countermeasures, um, call them actions under the under the plea of necessity, um, call them um, you know, go back to the Caroline criteria, uh, Caroline case criteria, which are 150 years old and still work quite well. Um, you may at some point decide and, and have a pretty good legal argument um, to actually act in response to cyber activities directed against you, um, possibly through the use of force, um, be it via cyber, be it, be it kinetic, um, yet remain below that threshold of an armed conflict and, and IHL. And uh, I, I suspect um, that that is in fact it's below that threshold, but where sort of cyber skirmishing, if you will, um, where, where most of the activity is going to be happening um, in the future. Um, a, a, strict, a strictly um, cyber armed conflict um, is, is certainly feasible, um, but I, I don't think that's what we'll be seeing most of. On that note, I actually uh, am thinking about these issues, so I'm going to put that uh, to the panelists too, kind of this notion of the way forward. This is, this is the way forward, countermeasures, cyber skirmishes, kind of knowing what IHL says and knowing what maybe Article 51 at least broadly, ambiguously says, you know, gravity, scope, duration, these types of things. Um, states know this, and so what are they doing? Well, they're being smart about it, and they're trying to keep it below those levels. So if it's a strategic choice to keep below those levels, um, what do you guys see as the, the way forward, right? Maybe, maybe some, some optimism. Um, that, might, <laughs> that might be nice, but um, what, where do you guys see this going? Uh, I won't be optimistic. I'll, I'll say that there's a real puzzle here, because it's a real moral puzzle. Um, several of the philosophers, that have been part of the workshop the past couple of days, we've had this conversation a few times, which is that if, if you keep the harms low enough, 
right? There's an interesting uh, moral question here of if could, if could they aggregate together enough such that they that they justify a response. Setting aside the legal question, I really don't know, but morally I also don't know, right? Because there's certain types of harms that you might think, so imagine a state, a state B, that's being attacked by state A, and state A is doing all these low-level cyber attacks, but really, if you take an effects-based approach to how we should weigh out cyber attacks, if you say, look, just, to, to just look at the effects of the cyber attack, and however you can quantify that, maybe in monetary cost or some kind of damage, Compare that to the effects of a conventional attack. If you take that approach, then you can somehow kind of get a cost and estimate to them. But imagine the state that's under these attacks that they have no way to respond cyberly, that they could respond kinetically and perhaps even lethally. It's a very difficult moral puzzle to suggest that uh, these low-level harms, which are clearly harms and clearly wrong perhaps, let's just say, let's say unjust and, and immoral to do, whether or not they can be aggregated up enough to give a a uh, different kind of harm, if you think there's kinds of harms, response, like death or killing or a kinetic response. Now, on one view, uh, you could say, of course they can, right? And if you add up enough of these small harms, then you can respond with a perhaps proper, justifiable response because you think harm is all on a continuum. On another view, you might think these are distinctly kinds of different kinds of harms, that especially once we start using bombs and bullets and actually killing human beings, that that's a different kind of force such that these smaller harms could never add up to it. I'm genuinely torn on which way I go on it. There's philosophers in this room that have established both of those camps. But notice however you answer that is going, I think should dramatically dictate the law on cyber harm going forward because I think the most likely future scenario is this low level very small state to state often, but also non-state cyber harms that's below this threshold, but yet is significant and matters. And it can be very large if you aggregate it together. And so that, I think, is the fundamental moral question to answer. Uh, and it, and it's, it's a puzzle for moral philosophy far beyond cyber war, but cyber war just really presses it as a pragmatic question we have to answer. And as a, it's a perfectly good description as, a, as the future that I see as well. So I'm, I wish I could give you optimism about that. I, I note that Iran, who is, is known to be the victim of something called Stuxnet, uh, whether or not it was perpetrated by the United States or Israel or some other country, uh, has not said very much about it. Ha, right. has not complained very much, hasn't tried to, to, to complain about it very much. Uh, and to the extent that international law is set by the behavior of states, and if they're silent about it, if they don't complain about it, or if, they're, if this t tradition takes on a practice of not, the people don't, not complaining about it, it establishes a precedent that this is not something to complain about. <laughs> and, and so it is by definition below threshold. Uh, and, and if it's below threshold, you can see a lot more of the stuff happening. So the effects I, were significant. The except, and the effects were still significant. Yeah. So if a bomb had done them, if a missile had done them, it, it would not yeah. be considered right. insignificant. But it was a That's very right. significant effect. That's yeah. right. So. <clears throat> uh, <coughs> sorry, I probably. Are I mean, we don't know what the future will be. Um, it's true that the likelihood of uh, cyber-only grand-scale warfare is probably unlikely because if states are having uh, cyber attacks of a huge magnitude and respond to it, they probably will make at some point the political decision to also resort to kinetics, probably especially the ones who have possibly less cyber capacity. Uh, um, but that's all, uh, I mean, it's unknown and the future will say. Uh, and what will certainly also occur in the future and already occurred and will continue to occur is that in ongoing armed conflict, cyber operation will be more and more used. Uh, and unfortunately, conflicts have been here and uh, will unfortunately probably remain here. So we will certainly see more and more cyber operation within ongoing armed conflict and that's why we have also uh, so much concern about it, and not only on the below the threshold issue, which is certainly extremely important as well. I don't want to uh, dispute that, but I think the within uh, IHL is also very important because it will be used within otherwise kinetic armed um, conflict. And I'm not saying it's a good thing, I'm just saying that's a fact. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't imagine that someone with the, who works for the ICRC would want to see more violence done during war, but um, that's a, I hope it's a safe assumption, I hope. Um, <laughs> Dr. Lungi. And uh, personally, I also share the optimism uh, uh, expressed by uh, other uh, colleagues. Uh, in recent years, we know there is a lot of uh, uh, discussion internationally uh, about how to protect the, uh, how to tackle cyber uh, uh, threats and uh, protect the interests of the netizens. Uh, and uh, uh, some discussions are very uh, uh, constructive, uh, valuable, and uh, meaningful. And I think that in the future we should have uh, continue this process of uh, discussion. And uh, my my idea is that we, if we really uh, 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 want to tackle uh, the cyber threats uh, and to uh, build a, a peaceful, uh, secure, uh, and uh, open, cooperative, uh, even resili uh, resilient uh, cyberspace. Uh, we can, uh, I think, personally, I think we can uh, take several measures uh, on several levels. First, uh, on the uh, global level, uh, you see last year the third UNGGE have uh, released uh, a rich, uh, consensus, rich uh, consensus report. I think uh, a, a, that is a kind of a milestone style uh, report, a, a consensus, a lot of consensus was reached. And I think in the future, more work should be, uh, should be done on the basis of uh, last year's uh, uh, report. Secondly, on the regional level, and now we see uh, uh, the regional uh, organizations are very active in, uh, on cyber issues. For example, the uh, OSCE and the OS, Organization, Organization of American States, and the AF, uh, uh, AF and ASEAN Regional Forum, and other countries. And uh, these uh, regional organizations, organizations uh, focus on uh, specific and concrete measures, for example, uh, CBM, CCPM, cyber companies building measures. Uh, I think uh, the, all these are very good steps, and uh, this process will should continue. And, and uh, of course, bilaterally, I think, uh, uh, states can do a, a lot. Uh, in recent years, we see a burdening of bilateral uh, <coughs> cybersecurity consultation dialogues. Uh, I think this uh, kind of uh, momentum and uh, uh, should also uh, uh, be continued. And on the state level, uh, I think the state should also take uh, show its respon uh, responsibility to uh, maintain the, the cyber order, maintain cyber security, and tackle cyber threats. Thank you, Duco. Um, well, I'm, I'm sort of torn both between optimism, optimism and pessimism. Um, I think as, as Bradley already argued, um, people do terrible things to each other. We've been doing them pretty much since we climbed out of the trees and learned how to walk. We've just gotten an awful lot better at them. Um, so uh, be it crime, be it warfare, be it um, just annoying people, which is still within the law, just unpleasant. Um, We've, we've gotten an awful lot better at them, and cyber offers many exciting new opportunities of being unpleasant towards each other. Um, that said, um, we've, mankind has, has, over the millennia, learned to deal with most of that, and I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to deal with it as well um, with, with this um, new particular set of, of being unpleasant toward each other. And, I mean, we do have the framework. Um, there, there are legal regimes governing pretty much everything from from crime to to warfare to um, to commerce. Uh, I mean, just put cyber in front of it, and it sounds new and exciting, and it's a whole tabula rasa. But it 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 really isn't. Um, there is the the frameworks are there, um, and there is certainly going to be a slight practical challenge in applying these frameworks exactly to a new situation. Um, but as I said, when if we get back to IHL, as I, I, I said to Laurent uh, earlier today, um, you know, if when we started out with the Geneva Convention, the, the first one, and, and the first Hague Convention of, of 1907, um, Sorry. and I think the Sennheiser Corporation really disliked me. Um, when, when we started out with the, the corpus of what, what has evolved but is, is still 
largely there, um, of IHL, the airplane had not been invented, or it was around, it was, was, was really not used. This, this added a whole new dimension to warfare. Um, and nevertheless, here we are 100 years later, even more, and you know, we've found that IHL pretty much does the job for that as well. We didn't have to make a whole special you know, Geneva Convention for anything that flies. Um, it was, you know, it, it was incorporated and, and it was slightly, you had to do a little bit of interpretation, but it, it sort of worked. So I, I do have confidence that um, given enough state practice, which is of course a bad thing because that means that we have a cyber war, um, but that in, in time um, we'll, we'll manage to, to adapt the framework um, or at least via some minor interpretations and, and make that work for cyber as well. Um, however, do not have the illusion that um, peace will break out and mankind will be friendly toward each other because that's not really the way we're hardwired. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, one second. Oh. <coughs> Well, I actually think there's an empirical argument here that I'm going to push back on both of you. Um, I am in charge. Um, no, it, it, that there is some some data being collected right now by social scientists looking at um, the the behavior of states in cyberspace, and um, one data set in particular finds that uh, for the most part, states are showing cyber restraint. That they are not engaging in, um, they are engaging in attacks, right? But they're these lower level attacks and they're not responding in kind and they're not escalating. And so, if that's the case, we have kind of optimism and pessimism in one thing, right? They're actually engaging in it, but they're also engaging in a norm formation. So, um, they are starting to engage in this, this creation of norms, this creation of um, peaceful restraints. They're not going out uh, with their shiny new toy and uh, blowing up our computers. So, hopefully, um, that might kind of go for both ways, right? The airplane was ter was horrible for armed conflict, but maybe cyber doesn't have to be. Um, I'd like to open it up the, the floor to more questions, unless my, unless the panelists want to keep. Uh, I was just gonna quickly point on that. I, I mean, I, of course, so maybe if the internet online didn't hear it. So the question was, hey, the airplane caused a whole lot of really bad stuff in war, and it, heck, it intentionally killed a bunch of non-combatants on large scales in horrible wars. So that's not a very good measure of success. Right, because because you're pointing out that hey, the airplane came along that was after the Geneva Conventions, and we figured it out. We got a way for IHL to work, and I think that's right. So I actually am going to kind of agree with both both points. It was, of course, terrible for humanity the way the airplane was used in these wrongful ways in, in in war. But of course, he's correct that we figured out how IHL can talk about that and can think about that and can say why it was wrong because it was targeting non-combatants. And what have you now since seen, since the early uses of air, air power and war, we have seen, I think, tremendous moral improvement. Uh, air, air weaponry now, of course, across militaries is becoming ever more precise. It's intended to cause ever lesser collateral damage, still too much, of course, but, but less. It's, yeah, think, of the, think of the carpet bombing of earlier eras compared to the precision JDAMs of today. So it doesn't mean that uh, that's, of course, perfect, but it means we have a moral trajectory, and I think we have IHL. Its attempt to put legal language onto air power and war is responsible for a lot of that trajectory, and so that's a good thing. So it, it might not be a success story, but it, it might be a sign that IHL is malleable in these ways that could be helpful, and I think that was your point. Yeah. The optimist says this is the best. Yeah. It took us too long. That's right. Yeah. Shannon. I hope this works. Um, uh, just given uh, that 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 basic notion that that states are kind of self uh, synchronizing or some similar word, um, that is the job of those of us who do normative uh, work. So that I'm including lawyers. Uh, ethicists and soft-hearted strategists like myself, um, is, the, is our job really to try to map this, this emerging uh, kind of convention, if you like, or is the job to really try to steer it and, and guide it, do you think? Should we, should we be a thermometer or a thermostat, right? I, <laughs> I think we should do our best to be a thermostat, right, to try to change and to 
of course, influence. Because we are thinking hard about these questions, and as is often pointed out, and it really was again the same thing with the air, air power, uh, the technology moves faster than the policy, and the technology moves faster than the ethicists and the lawyers, and it certainly moves faster than any ability to kind of enforce international humanitarian law onto these things. So, and to the extent that we can, we should try to be thermostats. That said, I don't know how successful we'll be at that. I don't know if it <coughs> And I'd, I'll, I, given that we've had some uh, policy debates, I'd actually like to put the kibosh on that one more time. Um, no domestic state foreign policy or policy positions, so for the questions, but yeah. I'd like to raise uh, two, I hope, not controversial points. Uh, one is about collective security. I think it's clear that uh, preventing or stopping uh, cyber attacks uh, depends very much on collective action. And I think uh, uh, if there is real a desire to prevent threats to, uh, of war, threats of violence, I think uh, collective, uh, uh, collective action can be quite effective. Now, I think there is a need really to spell out what are real threats. And I think here, uh, uh, the ICRC can be do uh, uh, good work. Now, I think uh, uh, the second point is uh, that we all know that our increasing dependence on IT, on internet, everything increases not only our well-being but also our vulnerability, the fragility of the whole civilization. And I think there, uh, ICRC with its partners could do. I think, not just philosophical, but uh, specific thinking what that uh, vulnerability uh, could be, uh, could be uh, in the future. Uh, I would like to say, uh, like it was the case with anti-personal landmines, that is to say, okay, there we had already a problem, but saying, you know, this is, if this continues in the future, this is what happens. And I think this vulnerability and uh, fragility is what should be the concern and not so much of what happened uh, in the past. Would anyone like to respond? Yeah, thank you for the question and thank you also for the previous question which were very interesting. Certainly when a new technology emerges and then there is a poten it's potentially used uh, in armed conflict is the time to reflect on whether the specific characteristic of the technology and the risk that they pose in terms of potential human cost um, are adequately addressed by the law as it is today or whether that needs to lead to a new interpretation or to possibly new development of the law. Um, most of the development of the law occurred after practice have shown that there are um, huge uh, human costs to the use of a particular weapon. Um, but there is at least one example where the law moved quicker than the technology, which is banning uh, anti um, sorry, blinding laser weapons, uh, where the law moved quicker than the technology and they were banned before being ever used on the, uh, on the field. So that's the optimist note. Um, now, to come back on the, on the airplanes and the fact that they did, uh, I mean, human mankind did horrible stuff with airplane and whether uh, that means IHL failed the test, uh, I think we should be clear on how we uh, see the test, whether that means the rules is inadequate or whether that means the rules was not followed and was widely violated and whether it's a question of, uh, um, I mean, enforcement or how it is um, uh, complied with. Thank you. Um, and or understanding in that regard, and I think that's what was also expressed here earlier on the panel, is that the law as such uh, prohibits uh, wiping out cities uh, by airplanes or by any other means. That's a direct attack on civilians, so, and that's a war crime. If you just wipe out a city without further thinking. Uh, uh, now, whether that was what was done in the past or not, I'm not here to pass judgments, but you you use the word wiping out city, wiping out a city is not uh, directing an attack on a, a specific military objective, so the law prohibits it. Uh, sorry, in the green, and then a follow-up over here.
How's, how do you see this in terms of non-state activity? Because most of the conflicts today are, on, are non-international armed conflicts. And it might be likely that if a state even would carry out uh, an attack on another state, they would do that through a proxy, which would be, and it is today, most of the armed conflicts in the world are non-international and they are carried out. States are, although involved, but they are involved through their proxies. Uh, and how would you see that in, uh, in terms of, because then they wouldn't need to be carried out, I mean, in terms of command structure as well, they wouldn't need to be carried out from the ops room of some general, but they could be from a very small cell, four or five people, just in terms of how would this would apply to non-state actors. Whoever wants to take it, you're the expert. Um. Yeah, today armed conflicts are mainly non-international armed conflicts. Uh, the IHL, as you certainly know, applies also in non-international armed conflict, and uh, basically the rules on the conduct of hostilities, even if there is no treaty, but uh, are largely customary, uh, uh, at least with regard to, uh, as I said, conduct of hostilities for non-international armed conflict. So the non-state armed group, and if you really take talk uh, an IHL sense, an organized armed group, which is a party to the conflict, is subject to the same obligation uh, uh, than the state party when it uh, uh, resorts to cyber operations. So the same principle of distinction, proportionality, and precautions. Whether that makes it for that party easier to resort to that means because it's more easily available, uh, um, I don't know. Uh, um, Rifle are also extremely easily available all over the world, and that's how uh, most of uh, uh, non international conflict are waged today, at least on the non state actor side. Uh, uh, so, uh, legally speaking, there is. Mm, mm, I don't know whether there are more issues with non state actors using cyber operation than with a state party to the conflict uh, using um, cyber operation. Proxies. Uh, Again, maybe practically uh, for a state, it will be seen as being more convenient to work through proxies. Now, if uh, I mean, if the, the the question relies on effective control, and that's true for a cyber operation or for another one, if that proxy is under the effective control of the states, that's uh, the state's responsibility, uh, uh, and all um, the law of harm completely apply directly to the state. If it's not. Then that raised the question of whether the proxy is itself uh, an organized armed group in the legal sense and is a party to the conflict as such or not, or whether some of their members are directly participating in hostilities through the cyber operation, uh, uh, if you meet all the criteria for direct participation in hostility. So that opened a range of other <laughs> IHA issues which are not all specific uh, to cyber. Please. Um, to, just to throw in my, my two cents here, um, certainly you're, you're absolutely right that most conflict is now a non-international armed conflict. Um, and on, on the other hand, um, certainly, um, you know, to do cyber very, to do cyber attacks very well, um, to do something more elegant, more sophisticated, more effective than simple defacement or, or DDoS, which you know, pretty much any. Um, annoyed teenager can do from, from their bedroom, um, you, you do need a certain amount of capability. So these, these tiny cells, tiny groups, um, notwithstanding a number of Hollywood films, it, it's, it's very rare for you know, that to have any truly serious effect. Um, and the other thing is, um, and that, that's, that's where we come back to what Loyal said, um, the main issue really is, is compliance. Um, <coughs> Especially when, with regard to to non-state actors or organized armed groups, um, depending uh, how, how you call them, um, but that is no different from today. Um, compliance is an issue whether there's people chopping each other up with machete with machetes or whether they're doing unspeakable things with ones and zeros, um, and that that is something that <coughs> we need to think about, which we're thinking about, which regrettably has no easy solution. Um, but the framework is there again. Um, so it, it's not a legal issue, it's a compliance issue. And, and that's sort of the main takeaway, I think. So we've got time for one more question quickly. Um, and uh, actually, I, I promised. <laughs> I promised already. So um, if you could, and 
Thank you very much. Actually, my answer, my question has mostly been answered too because it was very much linked to the one that has just been uh, raised. The question of yeah, the discussion has been mostly focused on state to state. Um, issues, while uh, there is also great scope for um, use by non-state actors, and Mr. Leclerc, in a way, answered it. That my impression was that um, the analogy between kinetic weapons and cyber weapons um, was not entirely relevant, because maybe one difference was that uh, cyber weapons are more accessible to a broader range of people because yes, guns are accessible everywhere, but major pla planes and tanks and uh, heavy weapons or missiles are in general less accessible, but it appears, I don't know if it's the consensus that um, real serious weapons are not so, I've been too much influenced by Hollywood and the major weapons are not so accessible. And maybe um, Herb can quickly answer the technological capacity and then we'll finish this, this lovely session up. The, it is true that there are many equivalents of cyber weapons that are like small arms. They, they tend to be relatively, uh, I wouldn't say superficial, but they're relatively uh, broad spectrum. That is, they, they, they don't exercise a lot of selectivity. As you pointed out, you can do a denial of service attack from any, from any place and, and uh, so, and, and you can even go out and buy a botnet service to conduct a denial of attack, a denial of service attack for you. So you don't, you can buy the service, and, and you don't have to know anything. Uh, so there are those uh, at one end. Uh, at the very sophisticated end, the very sophisticated end turns out to be what you mean by that is is very highly targeted, highly selective. You want to go after a particular uranium enrichment centrifuge uh, or, or something like that. Uh, those are the kinds of, of capabilities that uh, you can purchase, but they cost a lot of money, they take a long time, you have to collect a lot of intelligence for, uh, for their effective operation and, and, and so on. Uh, so there's not a scale, the, the scale of how much it takes to invest uh, is really, uh, you know, the more money you spend, it typically is the less damage it does. That is, the more targeted the damage is. So. Oh, well, thank you. I'd, yeah, I think we're, we're at, right at our time. So I'd actually like to give our panelists a round of applause and thank them very much for their time today. Well, thank you, Ida. Um, now we have the pleasure to invite you um, for a drink in the other room outside. Before that, I just wanted to uh, thank a few people for the organization of this event. As we said at the beginning, uh, this event comes at the end of a two-day workshop, uh, which has been organized uh, by a group of academics sponsored by the US National Science Foundation and that we had the pleasure to host here. So I'd like to, to thank this group, uh, in particular, Pat Lean. Um, thank you, Pat. Uh, I'd like also to thank uh, BJ and uh, Fritz Olhoff for this uh, work we did together. Thank you very much. And on the, other, on the side of the ICRC, I'd like to thank all the colleagues who, who made it possible, uh, especially Anne Quintin, Geneviève Monnier, and uh, Boualem Belbashir for the, uh, the webcast. And I would like to thank all of you, uh, the audience, uh, for having braved the rain, and uh, also uh, for those who listened to this event on the internet, which was a good use of, of cyber. Uh, so thanks to everybody, and now let's uh, enjoy this drink. Thank you. <laughs>